Hey everyone, Luke Crumley here with Part of the Possible. I'm really excited today to bring you into this Zoom conversation that I'm having with a good friend and colleague, John Torres. John is the executive director for the Maryland Farm Bureau, and he preceded me in my current role with Ohio Corn and Wheat Growers Association. John is a passionate and professional advocate who has seen all sides of the state and federal process when it comes to legislation, when it comes to administrative rule changes, when it comes to all those things that we as advocates struggle to understand uh, when things don't seem to follow the process that we expect. But what he really brings to the table is an ability to communicate through stories. And today I've asked him to join us on the blog uh, in this vlog format to share with you some of his best lessons about telling your story. And he's got a powerful presentation. Uh, he calls it uh, your story, your, fill me in John here, what am I getting wrong? Your message. Your story, your, story, your message. And if you've been reading my blog for a while, you know storytelling is really important in advocacy. It's how we convey those really complex messages in a way that folks are gonna remember, and it doesn't rely so much on data because folks don't remember data, but they do remember how you make them feel. With that, I wanna turn it over to John. John, please introduce yourself and let's jump right in. Yeah, thanks so much, Luke. And for your, your listeners and readers, uh, pleasure. We've been working on trying to get this meeting set up between you and me to talk about this, whether it was a Britain blog or something for quite some time. So yeah, I do apologize, but uh, we wanted no. to, you know, the important stuff. And I felt like, hey, I need to, I need to, I need to put that out there. <laughs> Yeah, no, no apologies necessary. For, for folks who don't know, these agriculture organizations like Farm Bureau, like the organization I work for in my day job, um, these organizations are massively busy. Uh, for those, for the 99% of us who don't live and work on a farm, it can be really hard to understand just what these associations do in advocating for farmers. But John, working in the Maryland Farm Bureau, right there in the shadow of Washington, D.C., uh, in one of the most uh, regulated areas to farm in the country, has a lot of work on his plate fighting for farmers. Um, so when he says it's taken a while for us to get this on the books, um, there's good reason. There's good reason. There you go. Plenty of work to do. Well, let's 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 jump into this um, one, and, and and so people know just kind of a time perspective. We are having this discussion. It is February 10th. And around this time of the year, I get really excited because I'm a huge fan of college basketball and March Madness is right around the corner. And it lends itself really well to when I when I work to, to create this discussion or this training for farmers across the country. Um, I think of how we model the way. Right. This is one of these teaching and learning things of, of if people come to us and ask us. I've never spoken with a member of Congress before. I've never met with my county commissioners. I've never had to explain to anybody what I do for a living as a farmer or a professional advocate. Where do I even start? And so we, we want to open up the discussion with telling a story. I can't think of better stories to tell than sports stories and sports stories, particularly around March Madness time. And, I, and I'll open it up with this. Uh, and maybe for some of us that have a few more gray hairs than others, uh, not completely gray, we can open with a little story uh, about a basketball college basketball team that was known as the Cardiac Kids. In one of the most memorable March Madness situations ever, a basketball player from North Carolina State, Lorenzo Charles, hits a buzzer beating alley-oop uh, layup clinching the NCAA Men's Basketball Championship for the North Carolina Wolfpack, uh, uh, beating the University of Houston. So you go back, do your Googles, uh, check out Lorenzo Charles and, and that buzzer beater to win the NCAA Men's, uh, men's Tournament. But that sets the precedence for a much bigger sports story that I think a lot of people see and, and they see year in, year out. Ten years after that buzzer beater, Near the end of a long, far, hard road, uh, the championship winning coach at that time uh, accepts defeat. And that was Coach Jim Valvano. And not defeat in, in the sports sense, but a different type of battle that he, was fan, that he was facing. And as a lot of people who follow sports know, Jim fought a very long, uh, arduous fight with cancer. Uh, and toward the end of his career, uh, was honored by the sports community uh, with the very first Arthur Ashe Award given at the ESPY Awards. If you've ever watched these things, very emotional um, uh, stories. Um, usually something uh, in their life has triggered something 
catastrophic, usually, sometimes, uh, with these winners. But the reason I bring that up is because Jim, Coach Valvano, was the type of person that didn't let anything hold him down. He had goals. He had aspirations. He had the passion to teach young people to win, not only on the court, but also in life. And so if you go back when you have time and watch Coach Valvano's acceptance speech uh, at the SB Awards, the purpose of his speech was to tell people how important it was for the community to rally around supporting cancer research. Cancer is a very technical and hard subject, and we could probably get into the weeds pretty deep on the different types of cancers, the different types of treatments, why things work, why they don't work. Almost all of us have known somebody that's been affected by cancer and, and understand those types of things. But we know when we get into the weeds of the details of a disease or anything in the medical field, eyes can glaze over pretty quickly. The same thing happens mm -hmm. in agriculture and farming and natural resources. And uh, veterans so affairs do, and, and any veterans other affairs issue. and social security. Mm -hmm. and you well, when you, when you talk about cancer, I, so I, my personal connection is that my wife is the executive director for Susan G. Komen Columbus uh, that focuses on breast cancer research and support for survivors. And they're kind of on, on the forefront of having to advocate for a lot of these like really challenging topics. Right. So I, I can't wait to hear where you go with this. This is great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say if we were in a classroom setting, Hey, we would all sit mm -hmm. and watch, Coach Valvano's speech, and every time I do mm -hmm. that, if nobody's seen it before, hey, the tears come out. We'll have the mm -hmm. the handkerchiefs uh, off to the side. But when we when we look at the coach tell his story about cancer, it doesn't start with cancer. It doesn't start with the type of cancer. It doesn't even start with an ask for money. It starts with him telling his story about when he was a young uh, college uh, college coach. He was coaching the JV team, and as he explains it, uh, back in the day, colleges had JV teams. Well, we only have those in high school these days. I don't think any college has a JV team, but he was a young young coach, and he tells this story. I could about... have made the JV team at Otterbein. I can <laughs> tell you go. that, okay? <laughs> I was at Ohio State, so I would have been on like, the, <laughs> the intramural you know, squad. Yeah. Intramural yeah. team you know, that met at 3 a.m. at, at uh, yeah. the old Larkins Hall. People remember that, that maze of a building. Mm -hmm. um, well, what the coach talks about is, is all right, he's the JV coach at this college, and the kids that he's coaching are maybe one or two years younger than he is, you know, mm -hmm. and, and he's this new big, and so he was thinking about how do I motivate these uh, these young men to do something great? They were, they were losing in the first half of the game. They go in the lo locker room, and he was trying to think, what do I say? You know, all these great coaches have great inspirational messages. And he talks about that Vince Lombardi was his role model. He mm -hmm. loved listening to Vince Lombardi uh, motivate a team. And so uh, he talks about how uh, how Coach Lombardi had, had talked about, you know, if you remember a few things, only remember uh, a few things. You know, remember your family, remember God, your faith, and remember the Green Bay Packers. And so he goes into the locker room uh, at halftime of this game, and he says, well, the thing that Coach Lombardi did was he'd let the team sit in the locker room for most of the halftime and then let them wonder where the coach was and build up this level of anxiety and, and, and anticipation. So he did the same thing. Coach Lombardi did the same thing. So he waits outside the locker room until three minutes left in halftime, and he wanted to do this great entrance right everyone wants to have the spectacular mm -hmm. entrance here comes a great coach to bring us motivation and so he talks about pushing the doors wide open you know bursting the doors wide open to make a grand entrance but the doors were locked and he jammed his arm and like he's like in pain withering away trying to do this great thing and so he <laughs> shakes that off goes into the locker room gives the great speech to, to the to the jv team and tells them exactly what vince, uh, vince Lombardi told his team hey remember your faith remember your family and remember the Green Bay Packers. And he was not <laughs> at the Green Bay Packers, obviously. And so he sets the stage for place where he is mm -hmm. and character, who he is, about let me tell you about my life and who I get to know me as a person and mm -hmm. some of the struggles or some of the highlights, funny points of my career. Because at this point, you know, he's he's known as a great basketball coach. He had, you know, like a lot of great basketball coaches do, they sometimes don't always agree with their administration at the universities mm -hmm. that they're at. There's some other things going on. So he had been through all that. But at this point in his career, 
and where he is with his battle battle of cancer, uh, things have changed, right? They're looking at him as 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 a great coach, and what is the legacy he's leaving behind? And something to to add to the narrative of the story, as Coach Velvano is on stage giving his speech, his acceptance award speech. The backstory of it is that Coach Shashevsky at Duke uh, was. Uh, assigned to go pick him up, pick up Coach Vavano from his home because he was in the middle of, of chemo treatments uh, and Coach Vavano was not doing well. And as the backstory goes, they pick him up on a private jet. Coach Vavano is violently ill on the plane all the way mm-hmm. up until the moment that they get him to a seat in the arena, in the theater where they're doing the ESPY awards and, and the man can barely move. And so if you watch mm-hmm. the video, you can see that uh, people are providing him assistance as he's going up the stage. He's only a few weeks away. From uh, from losing the fight with cancer at this mm-hmm. point, but when you see him on stage, when he starts telling that story about his coach, JB coaching experience, everything changes. His posture changes. His voice changes. He comes. At you, there's a sense of life to him that you would not expect somebody who is at the 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 last stages of battling cancer would have. And so this energy comes out that he's sharing with the audience. And his point here is. I want you to feel I want you to feel as if you were in that locker room with me watching these embarrassing things happening that I did to myself <laughs> that sets the stage for this great career. Uh, and in doing so, he 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 starts talking about his personal goals and the goals that he shares mm-hmm. with others and structures his speech in a very important way. Because here's something to think about. When we're telling a story, we've got to have a roadmap for people to follow. That beginning, that mm-hmm. middle, and end of resolution. Mm-hmm. And as you listen to it, the man is such a great extemporaneous speaker that unknowingly he is he is structuring the speech in a way that gives you this whole storyline so that you can follow so that by the time you get to the resolution and everybody knows that the resolution with coach Valvano's um, cancer diagnosis is not a good one, but he doesn't make you feel sorry for him at the end. Mm -hmm. What he does is he asks for a call to action. He talks about other challenges that the world is facing. And if we pull together, how do we solve those challenges? And by Mm -hmm. the end of the speech, everybody is so motivated to say, yeah, I share his vision. I see how things uh, can work out for somebody who's going through challenges. I want to be a part of his shared vision and give to at what at that moment was created the Jim Belvano, the Jimmy V fund for cancer research that ESPN set up. And now we see it every Every fall at the start of the college basketball season is Jimmy V week. Uh, I think it, maybe it's in December, late November, early December. Uh, and you see that speech played over and over and over mm-hmm. again so that people can be reminded of the core mission. It wasn't the story of, hey, I'm losing my battle. Feel sorry for me. Or, hey, let me tell you about the technical aspects of the type of questioner I have and the type of research we need to do to fight it. It's, mm-hmm. no, we need to work together to fight this. Give something. I've given now you mm-hmm. give, and let's rally around this and do some great things. And that story has built over the years, since 1993, uh, this whole message and other Arthur Ashe Award recipients, um, you know, having similar battles. The As I'm idea- sitting here thinking about storytelling, John, um, you know, and I'm not as familiar with that story. I'm not a huge basketball fan. I'm a football fan. And, uh, you know, I probably spend more time watching war movies than uh, March Madness, right? But, um, you know, when when you tell it, uh, it's very clear that uh, how he told the story uh, was that he didn't place himself necessarily in the role of hero of the story. Think about it. He, he led with his failure. And instead, by putting the call to action in there, he's building to this point where it allows the listener an opportunity to become the hero. Does that does that resonate with you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. He, again, it goes back to that. He didn't, he never wanted anybody to feel sorry for, for his mm-hmm. situation. And you see that in his physical presence of he came to life on stage. And when it's mm-hmm. over and the lights go down, you see him being helped off stage. And then we know, you know, the, the story ends about three weeks after that, that acceptance mm-hmm. award. Well, when so we, many when times we, when we're fighting for the causes that we care about, we want to be the hero. We want to be the one who gets everything across the finish line when in reality we're trying to do something else, right? We're trying to get someone else to, to assume that mantle. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's that principle of how do you get your audience to feel the feeling on the message 
that you, as if as if you were in that locker room when all those things mm-hmm. were happening to the coach. And so when we talk about a speech like that, and I'll bring up another one that you're probably very mm-hmm. familiar with. Um, I asked the questions. What did you, here's, I'm reading off my list of questions. What did you hear? So mm-hmm. and a, an ideal exercise, if you have seen a great speech, watch it multiple times and only focus on one question at a time and then rewatch it and focus on the next question. But the questions I would ask you to, 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 to pay attention to is first, what did you hear? So maybe listen to the speech without, with your eyes closed or something like that in a dark room. Then what did you not hear? What was said mm-hmm. and what was not said equally as interesting in the that comes out next. What did you see in the, in the, in the instance of coach Valvano, how did his physical presence change on stage when mm-hmm. he began telling his story? And 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 so many times when you're in front, people get so nervous in, in public speaking. What do I do with my hands? Where do I do with my feet? What do I do? So those are the things that think even about. when we're on what camera, like talking? right now, I'm judging like, oh wait, uncross your arms, even though I'm just trying to be comfortable. It looks yeah. bad, right? Like every little thing gets in your head as you are in these settings with these decision makers who you're trying to influence. Uh, and you're right. We get in our own way. Yeah. The thing that I always, when I did public speaking training, I would tell, yeah. you got to make, you know, make it funny. And so I would say, mm-hmm. naturally so, when you speak with your hands and speaking with your hands is a good thing, there's limits, mm-hmm. you know, don't go all over the place. Mm-hmm. But the human eye will follow the hands. Mm-hmm. And so you got to be thinking about where you're moving your hands because your eyes are going to follow there. So I say, do not put your hands in places on your body that you do not want people to stare at. And so, and so then that's like, then people are worried about uh-huh. that. And then they think, now you do that multiple times and you practice it and then become a second nature and then you don't mm-hmm. worry about it. But think about that. What do I do with my hands? Well, don't put them someplace where you want people to be staring the entire time. So mm-hmm. I'll let your imagination run wild with that comment. But, uh, but you've got that. So what did you see? And then equally important, what did you not see? Mm-hmm. What were the distractions? You know, we're so used to, you know, we, we've got a, we did another training that was called death by PowerPoint. We see so many, you know, my natural preference is to tell a story without the use of very many visual aids, specifically Same. not PowerPoint, unless you have to show and demonstrate something of a technical nature, then, mm-hmm. Hey, bring out that PowerPoint, do something like that, but, but avoid that or bring some sort of stationary visual aid if you, if you need to, but keep it. I've got a, something. like a four hour training session that I do where I think I have 10 total slides. Yeah. So, you know, you can you can convey a lot with very little, but folks oftentimes default to these like lists of things that they want to cover and they read it verbatim. And that's death by PowerPoint. Right? That's that's the yeah. problem. I saw we did a training one time uh, for women in agriculture. And mm-hmm. uh, at the beginning of the training, we you said, come with a speech, no coaching, just deliver mm-hmm. the speech without any coaching. And we'll do it at the end. And the most effective one that I've seen that still sticks to me, I don't remember the, the, the young woman's name, but she was talking about women in agriculture. And her only visual aid that she had, she had an antique photograph of her great grandmother, you know, oh, on wow. their farm in like in the Midwest someplace. So think of Dust Bowl yeah. or whatever. And you had this antique sepia tone, large photo of her great grandmother. Mm-hmm. And that was the single image that she wanted to leave you with. And then talking about her family's legacy of strong women in her family in farming and agriculture. And that's all she wanted to do. Fantastic. Know, the story started with my great grandma, mm-hmm. grandmother and their struggle homesteading back in Oklahoma or wherever it was, you know, decades That's ago. perfect. It, you can keep it very simple. Then after what you hear and don't hear what you see and don't see, how did you feel? What emotions came to the surface when you were listening, actually listening to what was being said? Same thing. What did you not feel? Um, and we'll get to that feeling part here in a little bit. But those are two very important senses that you want to make sure that you understand. And what do you feel like doing? What do you not feel like doing? At the end of Coach Valvano's speech, you want to give your life savings to the Jimmy mm-hmm. V Foundation for Cancer Research. Or maybe you're like, uh, you've heard some pitch from somebody who's knocking door to door. Or, hey, the, the telephone rings from a number you don't recognize and they say, hey, your car warranty is expired. Would you like to renew? And you're like, how does that make you feel or not feel when you get a message like that? The 18th and so those, time they call that day, by the way. <laughs> exactly. And so those are the things that you want to start examining. So I'll give you one other example of a speech, Luke, that I think you're 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 probably mm-hmm. familiar with. Uh, and we just um, 
commemorated this event, but uh, in, in the 80s, uh, the space shuttle Challenger that exploded mm -hmm. uh, uh, early flight going up. Uh, and following, uh, immediately following the explosion, uh, President Reagan, Ronald Reagan was president of the United States at the time. Uh, as, as presidents often knew, they've got a busy schedule. Things are happening. So the president was was out and about uh, doing daily business and his staff came to him and said, hey, the, the space shuttle exploded. And I'm, I, I would, can only assume that he was watching it, but if he wasn't, who knows? Um, mm -hmm. but, but the discussion in the White House was, we need to address this. How do we address it? And so the president made a very strategic decision to say, at the, at the time, and again, those with probably a few more gray hairs than others probably remember this, when we were in school, in elementary school, we, it was routine to watch the space shuttle take mm -hmm. off. That was part of the daily curriculum. And, and so he knew that probably a, a large percentage of school children were watching the space shuttle and watched the explosion. And how do you address a very sensitive topic with children all over the country, mm -hmm. let alone that it's a very heavy topic for adults to begin with and the people working at NASA and, and, you know, all those types of, so he decided it was a national address in the evening address the whole country. And what he talked about wasn't again, the technical challenges of what went wrong. It was America recognized that we have a lot of work to do in space or exploration. We want to get there before mm -hmm. the Russians, the Chinese, whomever we as a country Recognize that when we take challenges and risks, sometimes some things go wrong, but those challenges aren't going to stop us. We're mm -hmm. going to remember those brave individuals that were on the space shuttle, and we're going to continue to move forward in, in the name of advancement for what we're mm -hmm. trying to do uh, in this country. And, you know, leaves uh, you with a very... Um, so uh, hope emotional filled. thing, yeah. Hopeful, hopeful. Yeah. A, you, you don't you don't feel you're not going to break down and cry because you feel sorry for mm -hmm. what happened. You might be emotional because you felt re inspired by hey, let's stay mm -hmm. the course on this thing. We've got a lot of good work that's going to come out of this, and the tragedies today will will help help advance this even further. And well, we'll, when we'll he finishes take the with that poem, um, written yeah. by a, I think it was a World War One fighter pilot who uh, wrote a poem just before his own death. Um, the, the poem was quoted by Reagan uh, at the very end of that speech. And is that what you want to call out here, that poetic imagery yeah. or, yeah? yeah absolutely, that poetic imagery. Hit with it. We, yeah, uh, oh, and I, this is one where I wasn't prepared. I don't have it memorized, <laughs> but what, that they slipped through the surly bounds of earth to touch the face of God or something along those lines. Yep. Yep. The image that America saw early that day, they saw the space shuttle in flight, right? And you mm -hmm. see it explode. And mm -hmm. when he gives that end of the speech, you could almost visualize, if you're a person mm -hmm. of faith, the souls of those eight astronauts leaving the mm -hmm. space shuttle to continue, you know, reaching out uh, to God in the heavens. And that's what he wants to, to leave you with, uh, yeah. that message and say, we're going to we're, we're going to move forward. And so that was a masterclass in mm -hmm. storytelling and how we, and one that, he didn't have a whole lot of time to prepare that. That was not a no. week's preparation. It was a, mm -hmm. oh, crap, this just happened. How do we address this? And how do we mm -hmm. instill confidence in the American people that space exploration is a worthy endeavor for mm -hmm. this country? And we've got a lot of work to do. And, and yeah, charities happen, but we're going to build on it and, and commemorate these people. So Yeah, one of those great moments. I mean, obviously, the, the surrounding uh, event, tragic. But when you look at leadership moments, when you look at, you know, the president was there, in effect, reverse advocating, trying to get the American people to continue to believe in this really expensive, uh, really dangerous venture that doesn't always have clear connections to our own life and livelihoods, right? It's it's tough sometimes to capture just what uh, space exploration means for all of us. I mean, obviously, I'm a nerd. Right. So I study this stuff. But yeah, follow Luke but, on Twitter. You won't know when every space thing will happen. <laughs> Maybe not every. I mean, there are plenty of folks who do that. But um, you know, when when we try to make those connections, you know, it's also really easy for us to say, Oh, well, but he's Ronald freaking Reagan, right? He's the great communicator. What can I do? How can I ever live up to something like that? Yeah, I, th I think that's an excellent point. You take uh, an experienced basketball coach or president of the United States. Mm -hmm. They're great figures. They have practice of doing this all the time. I think the ultimate message is 
all of us are storytellers. All of us have mm-hmm. the ability to tell a, sto- tell a story. And if we don't know how, there are some really simple tools that mm-hmm. all you have to do is practice. Uh, and that's how you become a great storyteller, just like everything mm-hmm. else uh, that, that, that people are great in life. They practice over time. And, and I have and a and feeling you're going to give us those practice. tools. <laughs> Yeah, we'll hit on a few of those tips here. <laughs> so I think the most important thing is anyone can tell a story. Mm-hmm. Now we need to we need to think about how to do it. I'll I'll, I'll go back to some tragic high school experience in, in my life. My friends, we we always had the saying that we would say if somebody would tell a story and somebody was really bad at storytelling, uh, at the end of the long painful story uh, that was told, we would always respond with great story like in a very sarcastic way ours was always and then you found five (laughs) dollars there you go (laughs) so so i always think about those those oh you know tragic high school moments where my Mm -hmm. friends great storied me and i was like yeah that you know i guess you had to have been there (laughs) but a great storyteller will make you feel as if you were there and so Mm -hmm. and so there's Mm -hmm. some 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 tips and tricks that we can that we can talk about uh, going into that well, hit so, me with it. Yeah, hit you. So when we think about modern storytelling, you know, we got coaches in the 90s, presidents in the 80s. All of us love, maybe some more than others, the movies. The movies are great mediums for, for telling mm-hmm. stories, particularly children's stories. And so when we started diving into what is a great formula for telling stories, we went out and looked and we found that none other than the folks at Pixar had known that they were telling great stories based on all the awards that they were winning mm-hmm. with with movies like Toy Story and Finding Nemo and and all those great great animated films is that they 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 said hey when we look at how we tell a story there absolutely is a formula to this and how can stories like your toys coming to life uh, really captivate the imagination mm-hmm. or a fish getting lost in the middle of the ocean, making friends mm-hmm. along the way and all these types of things that happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so um, for those that, that want to dive into it, we, we can probably put together some show notes for, for your listeners to, to explore uh, a, a, a resource called the Khan Academy, a, per, a free resource that you can learn about just about anything on there. Pixar teamed up with the Khan Academy and created a series called Story in a Box that kind of mm-hmm. unveils the magic sauce behind the stories that they that they that they tell it to everybody and two things when you tell a story that you want to make sure you have are place and setting so think about a theater or a stage play mm-hmm. or drama take dramatization you're on stage and the stage the the act will happen at a certain place in time so what is the place and time and establish it and then and so you can you want your audience to know exactly where and when the story is happening followed by your characters and whether it's a villain or a hero, you want your audience to have a feeling about those characters. You want them to actually value the characters, mm-hmm. even if they're a villain. You don't want, uh, you know, the Wicked Witch of the West. All right, somebody might say, "Yeah, that that Wicked Witch of the West. She reminds me of me. That's kind of mm-hmm. my person. And I connect with her. All right, fine. But, you know, I hope you're really nice to people. But even a villain can have a <laughs> connection to an audience. Finding Nemo is nothing <laughs> without the dentist, but the dentist was just trying to do something nice for his niece or whatever, right? Like, yep. yeah, even the even the villain has this redeeming quality almost um, so that you understand and you can you can understand the motivation uh, behind their actions. Yeah, absolutely. And so you think about the setting, the place and time and the people or the character, mm-hmm. right? And I guess in Toy Story, they're not people, they might be toys or whatever, whatever the... Uh, the personification there are people to my four-year-old right now so (laughs) absolutely (laughs) are the monsters in the closet from Mm -hmm. monsters inc Mm -hmm. or something like that uh and so once you bring those once you have those two things ideas concretely in place the setting and the characters then you can start building story structure around that the story begins and something happens and then a lot of times particularly in in Toy Story movies, or for any of those, when I, I remember when I was a county farm bureau director in Ohio in Pickway County, we would never start a board meeting without many of the farmers, uh, uh, gentlemen, talking about. And this was during the off season, usually in the winter months, when not a whole lot of planting was going on. So the favorite entertainment of the winter months uh, in Pickway County, sorry if I'm calling anybody out, were, were daytime soap operas. So we could not start a board meeting without a debrief on what happened on Young and the Restless. Uh, every day, and if anybody's watched day, 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 daytime soaps, it's not just 
something happens. It's like 25 things happen oh, yeah. simultaneously at 30 different locations with this person's baby mama and this rogue business person and who knows what else is going on. And so, so start with something simple, something happens, but then mm -hmm. we can add some dy dyna uh, dynamic aspects of multiple mm -hmm. things are happening and how do they dovetail into our resolution at the end. So, so those are some things that we want to talk about first is how do we then start building that, that, that engagement by those components, place, characters, and then structure. Something begins, something or multiple things happens, and then there's a resolution. And mm -hmm. that's really kind of what we want to focus on in telling the story. So I don't know, if I don't know how to talk about the conservation management practices that I've been up, put on my farm that benefit Lake Erie water quality in the Western Basin, how do I even begin to talk about that? Just like mm -hmm. Coach Valvano, talk about how your farm started. Who in your family, who, mm -hmm. so characters, the people in your family, place. If I'm in Northwest Ohio and was settled by my German ancestors that came here in 1792 or whenever, who, are the, who were those people? Tell me about their livelihood and, and their struggles and everything that, that happened. And then that's where the story begins. And eventually you come around, uh, you being whoever the, the person is uh, telling the story, mm -hmm. and something happened. Oh, there, there's there's all this green stuff burning in the water. Oh, then the city of Toledo shut, shut the water down. And then, oh, people were looking at farmers, asking them what, what, what was happening. And maybe we add some more characters. There's a villain in this. Maybe uh, an angry government official said, no, we, we, need, we need mandates and we need regulation. And how do you turn that into a character or mm -hmm. a threat line or something like that? And so now there's drama that is created. And how do we mm -hmm. resolve that drama? And one of the things that's going to tie the character is that journey through a struggle, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to take you through hell, so to speak, and the characters and places around you are going to help you resolve that drama at the end. Now, I will say this from a personal side and don't go down a little rabbit hole and don't think ill of me, but sometimes I look a, watch a story, I listen to a story, and I sometimes think, how would this end if the bad guy won or the bad guys? Mm -hmm. What if it was not a happy mm -hmm. ending? When we know in real life, we don't always have happy endings. That, that That's life. And so you don't always want to tell a story with a rosy picture at the end. But let's say you tell a story where you're in the middle of that drama, or that struggle right now. And so just like Coach Vavano, I'm in the middle of this cancer struggle right now. I don't necessarily know how this is going to end, but I know that you can help me find some resolve to this mm -hmm. in some form or fashion. So maybe we end the story without resolution because there's a call to action and the, and the end of the story is yet to be written. And we've mm -hmm. got to bring the audience as character members into the, into the setting to help us find that resolution. And when we talk about advocacy so many times, that's what it is. I need you to call your member of Congress. I need you to show up to a town hall meeting. I need you to write a letter. I need you to share your own story. So it doesn't seem like I'm out here by myself and this mm -hmm. bad thing is only happening to me when we know it's happening to so many other people. Um, and so we can then engage the audience in that call to action to be a part of that story because it has such a compelling place, character, and and this thing happened or these things happen that I want to be a part of it going forward. And we yeah, and I think I think Aaron Sorkin um said something oh. like, Yeah, Aaron, uh, yeah. So you're a West Wing fan too. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> um I think he said something like um a story without friction is a journal entry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I may have botched that <laughs> quote, but like if you think about if you think about a history book that you like to read versus a history book that you don't like to read. Yeah, the ones that are able to capture it as a narrative instead of just relating facts are really important. Uh, but that narrative always has a point of friction that a hero is trying to overcome. And probably similar to you, how I how I describe it when I'm talking to prospective advocates is that our goal is not to be that hero. I mentioned that before. Our goal is to become that guide. So when you talk about those unresolved stories, uh, how I how I visualize that, how I capture that is that. Um, we're setting up this problem. We're trying to get our listener to uh, believe in the uh, bigness of the problem, right? Uh, just how how overwhelming the problem can be and that we need a hero. Uh, and it places that decision maker in that point of, of 
action where they can they can choose to become a hero and then we take on the role of guide trying to point them in the right direction of what action to take yeah oh absolutely and, and going with that direction and you can add some and if you don't have a resolution of the story as we often do in advocacy mm -hmm. a, a really important tool comes up next so as we've set the stage for our story we can let the imagination run a little bit of wild before we get into the hard facts and details. And what Pixar talks about and how they structure stories and how they make a story interesting is they ask one very simple question and they ask it over and over and over again. And that question is, what if? So mm. I've set the stage. Here's where I am, the place and time. Here are some introductory characters, some people, some toys, inanimate objects, whatever they may be. And once you have those there, what if, what if I was approached by a, a government regulator with a cease and desist letter? What if I showed up to that meeting and just talked about what, what was going on? What if somebody joined me? What if, and go through those scenarios of, if I'm trying to advocate for something, let your imagination run wild of what if X, what if somebody did this? What if this other thing happened? Uh, often in, in in the world of public policy, we call those hypotheticals. <laughs> and a lot of times, government people don't like hypotheticals. But to create a story, you can create a set of hypotheticals that lead to multiple potential resolutions. And when we talk about challenging public policy issues, we know that we can't come to the table with just one solution because mm -hmm. not everybody might agree with that solution. And mm -hmm. so if we build in multiple what ifs or multiple hypotheticals for potential resolutions that we can – I'm going to use a dirty word here, compromise on. Uh, Whoa, then wait, hey, we got to censor that out. Whoa, hey, four-letter word there. There you go. Then maybe we give the audience a chance to then embed themselves into the story to say, that what if could be something that I could do or help with mm -hmm. or could be an idea that I could help advance forward. And so when you start thinking about your your story and how you, what you're going to say is, my place and setting, place and time setting, people, and then the what ifs. And then the what ifs are going to lead us to what's at stake. If I don't find a resolution to this challenge, what will happen? What will the world look like? Think of it as, um, oh, I, I always get this wrong. Uh, a Christmas Carol. What is it? The 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 ghosts of Christmas past, present, and future. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, they, they 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 tell him, "Hey, if you made this decision, this is how the Christmas of the future will 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 look and be without you or or, or whatnot." Mm -hmm. So, what's at stake of if if the what ifs are not resolved, or if they are resolved, the what ifs should ask us to look at three different aspects of potential resolutions, whether they might be good resolutions, bad, or indifferent. Of what's at stake physically in the physical world in which the story takes place. What will happen? So if we're talking about a farmer that is dealing with conservation management issues, how does that change the aspect of my physical farm if I need to implement more conservation management practices? Mm -hmm. Or a regulation says you must have uh, a certain type of plan or document uh, to continue to farm. How does that, mm -hmm. that physical nature of your world change, of that setting change? Um, secondly, emotionally, what happens internally? to the psyche of the characters, whether they're the heroes or the villains or innocent innocent bystanders, what is mm -hmm. the emotional ramifications of the of the situation not resolving? And then third, what are the values? What are the intrinsic values? The good versus evil, right? What if Superman didn't show up and and attack the villain? Uh, right? What if the villain villain kept going with their mm -hmm. uh you know destruction across metropolis or, or whatever and so and so what are the values because at the end of the day what you want to do is have such an emotional connection with your audience those that are listening to your story that there is some sort of a, a shared value proposition between mm -hmm. you the storyteller and the person receiving the story uh, that they feel that yeah i, I want you to say that again i want you to say that whole sentence again because i think that's powerful yeah, what is when 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 you when you tell your story, you need your audience to have a shared value proposition with you and them so that they say, yes, I feel the same thing mm -hmm. that you feel. I value the same thing that I value that your resolution is on the side of good, not on the what side of what you're talking of, about there is common ground. 
right? Absolutely. So very much so. So in advocacy, even when we are dealing with folks who are ninety nine percent of the time on a the opposite end of the spectrum of us on every other issue, is there a is there a singular moment? Is there a singular issue? where we can have that shared value proposition, that common ground to convince them to take action. Too many times people are writing off these uh, uh, you know, regular opponents and not engaging with them because they think that the opponent won't listen to facts. Well, guess what? They might listen to your story. <laughs> they might well, buy into <laughs> what you are experiencing. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you an example of, of how you can win, win over uh, people in government and how you can like really get on their naughty list. Uh, and so mm -hmm. here in Maryland, we are uh, home of the Chesapeake Bay and we've got a lot of water quality uh, policies that we work on. Uh, and so a lot of people are engaged in that debate, farmers, environmentalists, all sorts of people. Mm -hmm. And a couple of years ago, we were engaging freshman legislators from urban areas of Maryland uh, to number one, build a relationship with, with them first, get to know mm -hmm. who they are as people, and then start introducing them to our story. Uh, mm -hmm. And as we were building this relationship over the course of a year, their freshman year in, in the state house, uh, we were at an event. I, I want to say we were at a dinner one night and one of the le legislators, uh, you know, I whatever the conversation was, she stopped me and she said, look, I want, I want to, I want to, I want you to know this, that you and your farmers come to us and you tell us your stories and you get to know us and we get to know you. And we really value that. What we're mm -hmm. really sick and tired of is that the people who are on the opposite side of your issue won't leave us alone. They pester us. They stop mm -hmm. us in the hallways. They shout at us. They, they're just like rambling with all sorts of facts that they're not familiar with and they're just bombarded with messages nonstop that are not of a personal nature but of a technical mm -hmm. nature and she said we're done listening to xyz groups like they have pretty much just mm -hmm. annoyed the crap out of us that we've just shut them down <laughs> right there was no emotional yeah. connection there. it was all let's annoy the crap out of the legislator and maybe they'll say yes and give mm -hmm. it to us and then we'll get our win that way that's not how you i mean think of your kids i don't have kids but think of your kids if you have kids mm -hmm. at home that are like, dad, 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 and won't stop and say, eventually he'll give in and let me have what I want, right? You know, the kids kids can wear you down like that. That is the wrong way to advocate for public policy at the state mm -hmm. house. Am I yeah, and unfortunately, yeah. it's used by way too many groups. I mean, yeah. when I was a congressional staffer, that's what we experienced from a lot of groups who ultimately got nowhere with their agenda. Now, you can you can show up regularly. In fact, you should. You should be building into your advocacy plans uh, techniques that force you to continue to show up in a repetitive manner. But you have to do it the right way. And you have you and I have talked about this before. Congressional Management Foundation has asked members of Congress and their staff, what are the most effective ways to engage with you? Uh, what helps you come to a decision if you haven't already on a big issue? And something like three quarters of members of Congress report that a personal, actually it's nine tenths, nine tenths of uh, members of Congress and their senior staff report that um, a personal story from a constituent is either effective or very effective in helping them come to a decision on an issue. Nine out of 10. But one out of 10 report frequently receiving those stories. So we, we see from these folks that we're trying to influence, they're saying, this is what I need, but this is what you're giving me. To your point, instead, advocacy groups are pushing activists out there to do things like follow Kristen Cinema into the restroom, which yeah. how effective is that for your cause, or to throw cans of soup onto Van Gogh paintings. <laughs> and instead, you know, of course, those are extremes. Most of most of the examples are folks just battering the door with stat after stat it after stat, trying to wear people down, right? When instead, if you can find that shared value proposition, to go back to what you were originally saying, find that shared value proposition, you can start to add value to each other. And, you know, I've seen the same thing happen on issue after issue after issue, where when we change from that mindset of we have to win to we have to win the person, you almost always start to advance toward having that person become a champion on your cause. Yeah, absolutely. I'll give you one extreme, another extreme example. And, and these are examples that nobody should ever 
do, uh, but but they they make for great training uh, fodder. We were working on an issue last year that is one of these perennial issues. I won't get into it because we could go down a rabbit hole pretty quickly. That we were our organization was on the anti side of the bill passing, and the the opposition wanted to have it passed, and they the opposition got really heated about it because it looked like it wasn't going to go their way, and mm-hmm. the bill was being debated in committee uh, in the state house. Well. It got to the point where the opposition recognized it really wasn't going to go their way. And so somebody on their team, if you want to call them that, uh, called a death threat to the chairman of the committee. Oh, my gosh. And, okay, that's uh, never a good move. Number one, it's illegal. So don't do that. Uh, And then, but the the committee chairman handled it with grace. Obviously, if you're, think, and, and one of the reasons besides it not being legal to do that. Think about how you would feel if somebody threatened your life or the l- life of your family members. That's not a good feeling. That's not. Something Are you going to come to their help? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Not not something you want to do. The chairman handled it with grace. At the next committee hearing, he let the committee room know, "Hey, I received a death threat over this issue, mm-hmm. and if this group or these people thought that that would be an effective way to advance their their um, their cause, they're wrong." And he said, "We're we're going to table the motion on this bill." And it went back into the mm-hmm. door, and he said. For the very reason that somebody decided to go to this extreme step, your the result this is going to resolve with you're not going to get your way now, and this is mm-hmm. you lost your chance. And so we were and, able to and folks, people, yeah, folks probably take for granted uh, the amount of influence individual elected officials have in those moments. You know, depending on how the legislature is constituted in your in your state, you know, there's a big difference between the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. Individual members of the Senate have a lot more ability to take action like that. Uh, but even in the House, that committee structure, those committee chairs, they can they set the agenda. That's and cool. you you go over that line, you're done. Your issue is done. So I don't I, I've never understood why folks choose that when, as you've shown here today, there's a proven way to win people to your side. Yeah. There's a proven way to move them from um antagonistic or uh, ambivalent on your issue to becoming a champion. And it's all in how you, you share your story and you make them a part of it. Yeah. And one of the things I, I one of the things I like to show every time we go to Capitol Hill in Washington, DC, mm-hmm. uh, when, when the Congress is in session, is you will almost always see this particular group of people, you will see protesters and Hey, the fir- I love the first amendment, right? Mm-hmm. Associations mm-hmm. engage first amendment, but protesters, particularly in D.C., when you see people picketing with signs and things of that nature, are often protesting because uh, they've no, they are no longer invited inside of the buildings. And I said, and, and, and I say, so I say, people ask, well, what are those people doing? Why are they protesting? What's going on? Why are they so angry? Mm. I, said, I said, you need to understand one thing about the angry protesters that you see outside of Congress. They've lost their invitation inside of the halls mm-hmm. of Congress. They are outside mm-hmm. because they are no longer invited to to the table because they've abused their privilege, their mm-hmm. first amendment. Privilege. And once you abuse that privilege, you're relegated to the street corner, holding signs and screaming at, at tourist eighth graders on their school trip. They have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, yeah. You still have the right to redress grievances to the government, yeah. Yeah. but you're going to do it by letter. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you it's know, not it's... in person anymore. <laughs> yeah. You're done. <laughs> oh, so, man. so when I take volunteers inside of the state house or inside Congress, and before we had that sit down meeting with, with the uh, legislative director or with the member themselves, I said, remember your the biggest goal here is to get an invitation to come back. We mm-hmm. will tell our stories, talk about what we're here to talk about. Often you have 10, 15 minutes. But the goal is to have at the end of the meeting say, I have the, the LD or the chief of staff or the member say, I would love to follow up with you on that. I'm out mm-hmm. of time, but let's connect again. Here's my phone number. Here's my email address. Here's, that's your invitation to come back and continue that storytelling and continue that relationship. Uh, if you oh, got man, the, that's that's if, so if, delicious if, because I literally just spent a day training aspiring advocates and talking about the same thing and how do we define a win? And they started off fully believing that a win was getting someone to vote a specific way on a bill. And I had to remind them that you never get there on the first conversation. Unless they're already there on that issue, that's not your win. Your win is have you, over the course of your meeting with them, established credibility and established an invitation to reconnect. And 
you know, the longer folks are in this work as a volunteer advocate or as a professional lobbyist like uh, you and I, the the more the more we understand that, the the more we're able to set our our political preferences aside, the more we're able to uh, ignore those ninety nine percent of the things we disagree on and realize that a simple win is, hey, they enjoyed talking to us and want to trust us for information in the future. Yeah. And I've seen it. It's only happened to me once early on when I, when I started working for Farm Bureau in Ohio. Uh, it was a Farm Bill year. Uh, we had a freshman member of, of, of the Ohio delegation who was put on the, the Ag Committee in the House of Representatives. No Ag background. So, uh, you know, he had done a tour of the district and we were part of the tour and we toured him around to farms and we had a county president who, who really tried to win, win him over uh, during a mm-hmm. farm bill year as a freshman uh, legisl- legislator. And so she built this relationship. And when it came time for the committee, as we're in the process now for the ag committee to start having field hearings and invite expert witnesses to testify on specific mm-hmm. parts of the farm bill, she got a phone call. She said, oh, the congressman awesome. was like, Hey, uh, you talked about this issue. This is in yeah. my subcommittee. I need you to help me with this. You yeah. build that relationship and you find yourself in the hot seat at a congressional mm-hmm. hearing telling your story to mm-hmm. an entire subcommittee or committee uh, because you created that 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 uh, that relationship that's open. That well, hold on, hold on. Let's dispel this a little bit because when people think of congressional hearings, they think of people being hauled before the committees in these like contentious 11 hour uh trial type settings but that's not what you're talking about here right that doesn't happen to an average advocate when when committees invite an advocate on a complex issue to come before them it's not that they're trying to run roughshod over them what are they trying to do john they're trying to bring the real story of a real american that has a problem that the legislation can affect somehow, Mm -hmm. whether positively or negatively, because it's no longer take my word for merit. I'm a member of Congress. Let me bring a real merit to the table, tell you Mm -hmm. how, how, how this is happening. And you're right. You're, 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 when you're invited by a phone call or an email versus invited through a subpoena, that's a different, there's a difference. (laughs) You can kind of tell how those two different things are going to (laughs) run. And so you, yeah, if you're getting a subpoena, uh, you got other issues you need to worry about. If you're getting the general I would love for you to tell your story as an invitation. Open it. I, I always tell folks your experience is your expertise. If you get that opportunity and you're invited, they're looking to take your experience and turn it into their own expertise. Because they're trying to they're trying to get beyond their inch deep, mile wide understanding of a thousand different issues. Uh, and really hone in on what's most important. And John, I know we are coming up close to uh, the time here that that we need to cut off for for both of our schedules but um, I wanted to ask you before before we wrap up um, you know you've laid out you've laid out good examples of really strong storytellers you've given us the formula from Pixar and you've shared some of your own experiences of what works and what doesn't work if you had one thing just one that, Someone who listens to this and watches it on YouTube or uh, reads a transcript, just one thing that you want them to remember, what would it be? Yeah. Remember how your story makes your audience feel and share the feeling. Notice that the only, the one thing I have not talked about yet in our discussion, I have not talked about how you share highly technical information. Mm-hmm. We haven't talked about the, the mistakes that engineers made in the space shuttle. We haven't talked about how the mm-hmm. oncologists diagnose and treat cancer or any of those types of things we 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 haven't talked about why genetic engineering is good for soil health Mm -hmm. you know and and the no wait till you open the heart up wait till you build the Mm -hmm. relationship that's what allows you then to come in and talk about the technical aspects so so often regardless of the issue people want to jump into the technical reasons why a bill should pass or or fail wait till uh, you open the heart up Oh yeah, man, open. that is yeah. juicy. That's and, juicy. And, yeah, wait till you open the heart. And, and and the Pixar model would say this because we talked about what's at stake in the story. And mm-hmm. here's how you frame book, book as we say, book and the story. Think about it in, in, in the the typical fairy tale step fashion. Once upon a time, mm-hmm. once upon a time, we were in a place and a time and a setting 
And every day, Luke did X, Y, and Z. And Luke's sphere of influence, his friends, his family, were these these folks. And they lived a happy life in their little village every day until one day something happened. Mm -hmm. And after that thing happened, because of that, something else happened. And then because of that, a chain effect of multiple things happening until finally there was some sort of resolution, something Mm -hmm. happened. And ever since then, what happened, that journey in Lord of the Rings, that was one of the uh, story that I'm really hooked on, uh, Lord of the Rings. And ever since Frodo threw the ring into the volcano, mm-hmm. then this happened. And the moral of the story is, and this is something that Pixar and Disney does extremely well. It's not just the story that once upon a time, something happened, the end, happily ever after. After the happily ever after, the debrief is, what is the moral moral? Mm-hmm. What is the moral outcome of mm-hmm. the, did we affect change in the world in a way that positively affects other people or negatively affects other people? What was the result of that journey we just went on? That needs to be part of the story of the the end doesn't come to the end until we debrief the value, the the the, the moral value outcome of, of the story. When we leave the theater, are we ready? to take on the role of Frodo? Are we ready to take on the role of Woody and Buzz? Are we ready to take on the role of Nemo's dad uh, and make sacrifices, make hard choices uh, to pursue a world that we can, we believe can be better. And with that, John, uh, I just want to thank you again. I always appreciate the time we get to spend together. I love learning from you and uh, love uh, being able to share the work that we do uh, in agriculture and just really appreciate you being willing to give so generously of your time to share with, you know, the the folks who read my blog and listen to uh, these episodes when I put them out. Um, Thank you so much. And I just want to, want to root for you, cheer for you here really loudly. Um, If you've never met John Torres before, uh, there's a reason why he's so good at what he does. Uh, it's because he puts these lessons into practice and how he relates to people every single day. He makes you feel like you are a part of his story, of his journey. And John, I just want to commend you for that and thank you once again for all that you do to help so many people. Thank you so much, Luke. And Sam, do you do great work there back in my state of Ohio. So, uh, so keep up great work as well. Thanks, brother.